Hey legend, so today's guest doesn't really need too much introduction. This is Professor Scott Galloway. You've probably seen him all over the internet in the last couple of years and he's just been you know, out there championing men, men's health and you know getting your finances in order, all the things that you need to do to become a man and whether that's in your 20s or into your 30s. He's got a really great list of suggestions and he's very articulate with how he delivers his message. So we jump in the deep end. We talk about the economic differences between men and women, what men and women are looking for. We talk about what men need right now in the world and his suggestions for your initiation, you know, your own personal initiation into becoming a man and contributing more to society than you take. It's a really great episode. It's a bit of a shorter one, about 45 minutes. So you can get in, you can get out with some really great content. Okay, beauty. Well, welcome, Scott. We're going to jump in the deep end. I really appreciate you giving me your time today. Hope you're great. It's my pleasure, Josh. Good to see you. Talking point I'd love to jump into is about economic viability between you know men and women. And mm-hmm. a lot of women will say, you know, 75% say economic viability is a key criteria in a mate, whereas 25% of guys, you know, say that it's like, it's pretty much the opposite. They don't really care. And which yeah. I could definitely attest to. What do you think are some key things, you know, maybe this included, maybe some other things as well that a lot of guys misunderstand about the dating market, you know, particularly in their thirties plus. Well, I'm not sure. I mean, you can scream at instinct, but it doesn't have to listen. And that is women, women are going to be at some point, if they decide to procreate are going to be more vulnerable. And for thousands of years, you know, our instincts and our emotions are largely driven around a small series of incentives that usually lead up or bubble up to ensuring that the species survives. So it feels really good to eat when you're hungry. Survival is great. If you are in a fire and you manage to escape, that feels really awesome. And having sex with someone feels really good. And women are going to have um, a finer filter around who they choose as sexual partners because the downside of sex is much greater in terms of pregnancy. And they are going to, uh, one, I mean, the criteria, keep in mind, the criteria for women uh, in terms of mating are, in, are one, uh, ability to signal resources. It's not even your resources at the time. It's your ability to signal resources moving forward. So I always tell men, I coach a lot of young men, you need a plan. You need to be self-reliant because um, women are going to be attracted if you are a guy who's coming out of Dartmouth and has a job at Google, you're signaling that you are, you have a plan, that you're disciplined, that you're able to delay gratification, and that you will be able to protect someone who you decide to procreate with. And that sounds very base and crass, but I have, you know, 30,000 years of evidence and data on my side. So ability to signal resources. Two, uh, intellect. And someone who is smart is generally, and again, it goes back to kind of survival and procreation, is more likely to make good decisions that result in the people uh, surrounding that person to survive and make good decisions. And uh, bringing it down to kind of mating dynamics, I've always said, if you can make someone laugh, you can probably kiss them. It's the fastest way to communicate intellect is, is humor. Uh, generally speaking, funny people have a form of intelligence. You could argue there's different forms of intelligence, but most, most very funny people are usually actually are, are quite intelligent. And the third thing is kindness. It doesn't matter how wealthy you are or, you know, how much you signal that you're going to acquire wealth or smart you are. If you're an asshole over the medium and long term, people decide not to partner with you professionally, and romantically. Uh, so those those three things are incredibly are, you know, that's kind of the shooting match. And so when you're younger, it's about having a plan, being disciplined, being self-reliant, showing that you have a path to this. What's happened in today's modern dating environment is that Western societies, especially America, becomes more like itself every day. And that is money is increasing stratification. It used to be business class versus coach. Now it's economy, economy, comfort, economy plus, business first, charter, fractional ownership, own a plane, G300, G5. It just The life that people, wealthy people lead is so now dramatically different. When I grew up, you know, the rich guy, the doctor, his kids went to the same school that I went to and they had a little bit nicer car, but it was a, you know, it was a car. And we all mostly lived in the same neighborhood. Maybe they lived in one neighborhood over in the posh part of town. 
the the delta between life in these economies if you're poor and rich grows and grows and grows and my father said when he moved when he immigrated to the u.s america is a terrible place to be stupid which was sort of a harsh thing to say but what he was saying is if you're poor you'd rather be in a socialist country than a capitalist one because we very much believe in winners and losers and we we probably aren't as kind as we could be to people struggling such that we can crowd more winnings to the winners. It's very much a bit of a Hunger Games economy in the West right now is how I would describe it. So I just think you have to be, as a man, um, cognizant of realistically what it is, why are women going to be um, attracted to you? And the, the you know, this will be the last point I'll make before I, I realize I'm blathering on here. But generally speaking, if you want to punch above your weight class, you're going to have to have one skill, and that is the willingness to endure rejection. And that's true professionally, you know, in terms of meeting people, being aggressive, sending emails, following up. Um, and if you want to punch above your weight class from a friendship standpoint, extending yourself as a friend, asking you know people out for beers or to a match or whatever it might be, and also romantically approaching people and enduring the possibility of rejection. And most men are not willing to endure that. Most entrepreneurs, most people are willing to endure rejection. And so they are not entrepreneurs. And the wealthiest people in our society are the ones who are willing to endure rejection and start their own companies. And there's no, you know, the upside can be unlimited if they work. You know, obviously it's a, it's a, it's a high bar. So your mm -hmm. willingness to endure rejection and also increasing your selection set of mates. And while we talk a lot about how do I increase my pool of my target market. One is, one is um, perseverance, ability to endure rejection. But even more than that, we don't talk enough about this, is to be the person that would be a great partner, such that you attract more mates. And generally speaking, it's on a very basic level. It's having a plan, being self-reliant, adding surplus value. You add more value to the community than you take. You are acquiring the skills and strengths such that you can protect and advocate for others. Um, that you're that you're smart, you work on yourself, and the three that you're kind. So the best way to establish economic security is to find a good partner, and the best way to find a good partner is one to be willing to endure rejection, which is the only guaranteed attribute of a success, you know, of a life of success. And um, three, really work on yourself and decide. It's not about finding the right partner, as much as it is is about turning yourself into a great potential partner. Mm. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. Curious, what like you know, you're coaching a lot of guys. Are there any common threads of what people are asking questions about, or, or topics that they're bringing up repetitively? The dynamic. So I coach a lot of young men um, who are not struggling, but a little bit lost. I think that in America and actually across the West we have decided that because I had advantage, because my, my you know, men, a uh, generation behind me had huge advantage, that the assumption is that young men have the same sort of advantage and there's absolutely no empathy for them. Despite the fact that young men in America are four times as likely to kill themselves as a woman, they're three times as likely to be addicted and 12 times as likely to be incarcerated, more single women own, ho own homes, and men, over the next five years, we're going to graduate almost two women for every one male we graduate from college. Now, if any group was experiencing this kind of decline or this sort of disparity in mental health or economic outcomes, there would be a lot of calls for social programs. When it was flipped to the other side of the ratio of college entrance 40, 50 years ago, we did something about it. We said, this is unacceptable. We need more women to have the same economic opportunities that higher education affords. So we had Title IX and affirmative action to level up non-whites and women. There's no such movement to level up men now, despite the fact that they're not doing well, especially young men. There's a general feeling, you, even the nomenclature, you hear, words, you hear words like accountability, or if they were only more in touch with their emotion, or they need to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. It's, in some, young men are paying for the sins of men of my generation and beyond. Mm -hmm. There's, and what... I think what we need to, the, the dynamic or what I hope is happening, and I think it's getting better, the conversation is becoming more productive. We need to recognize that empathy is not a zero-sum game. 
civil rights didn't hurt white people. Hetero, you know, gay marriage didn't hurt heteronormative marriage. And having empathy for a group of people that are really struggling, specifically young men, does not take away from women. And because so many people saw these, uh, saw what was happening with young men and didn't see anyone addressing it, unfortunately, the void was filled, at least initially, by some pretty unproductive voices. It felt just like thinly veiled misogyny. And it created a gag reflex that if you talk or you're seen as being quote unquote pro man, that it identifies you as likely being quite frankly, anti-women. And that kind of stalled the conversation, I think, or has been a misdirect for the last 10 years. And I think that we're finally starting to have a more productive conversation. What I hear from young men is that the, a lot of their opportunities that were afforded to men, my generation are no longer available. In addition, they're fighting against some of the most powerful organizations in the world that have created algorithms that addict them to fake friendship or thinking they can develop economic security by trading Solana on Coinbase, or they don't um, have the motivation to become an attractive partner. Maybe they feel some rejection online where online dating takes out all the different dimensions of, of attractiveness, whether it's smell or humor or kindness, becomes very two dimensional and it turns into massive mating inequality where 10% of the men get the vast majority of the interest. So a lot of, you know, the bottom, especially the bottom half in online dating of men, they get absolutely no interest. So a lot of these men feel a sense of despair. They feel like the professional world isn't interested in them. They feel like colleges aren't interested in them. The education system is highly biased against men. Um, on a, on a behavior adjusted basis, two 13 year olds in the principal's office, one, girl, one boy, the boy is uh, three times as likely, two to three times as likely to be suspended for the exact same behavior, a black boy five times as likely. If you think about what schools K through 12 are looking for, the student organized, pleaser, sit still, do your homework, turn your things in on time. They're basically describing the attributes that come much easier to a young a person born as a female than a person born as a male. In addition, there are more per capita female fighter pilots than there are male kindergarten teachers. So when you talk about a young man not establishing any male role models, men are leaving the profession of teaching somewhere between two thirds and 80% of K through 12 and primary school teachers are women. And there's nothing wrong with that. But who is a likely a teacher going to champion and look out for the person that reminds them of them at that age? And so there's not a lot of mentorship. I'm not sure there's as much championing. There's a bias and our society is outsourcing a lot of the middle-class jobs that gave men who weren't what I'll call academically exceptional and on-ramp into the middle class. And they become, in my opinion, susceptible to these negative voices. They become much more susceptible to um, conspiracy theory, nationalism. They become much more likely to be anti-immigrant. They become much more susceptible to misogynistic content. And some, they become shitty citizens. And they would draw and start having relationships with algorithms and screens as opposed to relationships with other people. And they never really develop the key skills to reenter the workforce or have real prospects for a romantic relationship. And the results is, well, you're Scott, are you, you're saying that, OK, loneliness isn't a big problem among women. Why, why is your hair not on fire there? And the reality is without a romantic or sexual relationship, women are much better at maintaining friend networks. They find places to give and receive love, even if the romantic part of their life isn't working out. In addition, they are dating older. Two out of three women in the United States under the age of 30 has a boyfriend. Only one in three men have a girlfriend because women are deciding that in order to find a mate or a potential mate that is economically and emotionally viable, they go older. And if you look at the most violent societies in the world, they all have one thing in common, and that is they have a disproportionate number of young men who are broke and alone. And we are producing too many of them in the West. And that just creates instability in our society. Mm. Yeah, it's pretty, it's very real. Like, I feel like, you know, if you talked about it 10 years ago, it didn't seem as real. It was kind of like, oh, yeah, sure, you know, it might happen. But now it's just, you can't ignore it, you know. I'd love to know if you could have, if you were like the ultimate decision maker of a social program, you know, you said we've got some for women and other, cult, you know, other groups, what would you put in place for, for young men? There's a variety of programs that would really help. Starting at a very young age, I like the idea of what they call redshirting kindergarten boys, and that is starting boys a year later. Uh, they, their prefrontal cortex, biologically, they don't mature as fast as girls. 
they don't mature as fast sexually. Girls are actually going through puberty sooner and men later, and they're not entirely sure why. But the bottom line is boys are just less mature biologically. So start them a year later. I get more men involved in primary education such that uh, men have more role models. Dramatically expand the number of freshman seats in colleges such that we can not only let in more men, but let in more trans kids, gay kids, white kids from Appalachia, just more. My, my industry has become very rejectionist and uh, kind of almost like a nimbus luxury brand position where we take pride in how many people we turn away. A series of tax policies and economic policies that stop transferring money from people your age to people my age. The two biggest tax deductions in the United States are mortgage tax, interest deduction, and capital gains. Who owns homes? People my age. Who rents? People your age. Um, who makes their money from stocks and investments? People my age. Who makes it from working? People your age. Who transfers, who gets tagged with a trillion and a half dollars in taxes that gets transferred to old people? People your age to people my age. And it kind of makes no sense in my view. Social Security has been a very successful social program here in the United States, but it needs updating. Because the average 70-year-old 40 years ago or now is 72% wealthier than they were 40 years ago. The average person under the age of 40 is 24% less wealthy. So what you have is a group of young people who have given up on trying to save for a home, are having trouble being, quite frankly, with young men, aren't just not as attractive to potential mates, lower household formation, birth rates are declining. And distinct to the moral argument, what seniors need to realize is that if they don't have enough young people to support the social programs, the society is going to collapse on itself. 40% of all government spending is now on programs going to people over the age of 65. And if we run out of young people who, quite frankly, are just more productive as, as a ratio, we don't have, not only have population decline, we have population denigration. You know, it's seen as ages, but the reality is old people don't want to work and become very expensive because of health care. And or maybe they want to work, but they typically retire. Whereas young people, fewer and fewer young people supporting an increasingly large population, it crowds out investment in infrastructure, technology, education, things that generally have a higher ROI than funding the health care of a senior. So uh, there's a series of economic programs. Um, also, just in the zeitgeist culturally, just a recognition of private conversation that we can have empathy for young men who are struggling. Uh, also, just generally, um, I think men and women, you know, it's easy to preach, but uh, take, recognize that the single point of failure, typically if you try and reverse engineer a young man coming off the tracks, it's when he loses his re male role model. And that is one in three men who get divorced within six years have no contact with their children. And I think that's really what it means to fail as a man, is you're no longer involved in your kid's life. I think that represents real failure. And by the way, it's not always just the man's fault. The courts are highly, divorce courts are highly biased against men. That 92% of the time women get custody of kids. Um, I mean, there's just, the court system does not look favorably upon men in the midst of the divorce process. And so I think there's a series of just honest conversations around trying to level up young people economically, um, ed more educational opportunities, more vocational programming. 50% of Germans have a vocational certification, only 5% in the United States, 11% of LinkedIn titles in the UK and Germany say apprentice. It's only 3% in the United States. There's a general feeling it's not as bad in Australia or Canada, but it's still bad. But there's a general feeling that as a parent and as a kid, you failed if your kid doesn't end up at a traditional four-year uh, college. And it's not obvious how they're going to recover from dropping out of college. It's seen as real shame. And two-thirds of our kids are not going to end up with traditional four-year degrees. So we need to stop shaming families and kids. You haven't failed as a parent or as a son or daughter if you don't end up with a traditional four-year degree. But we need to illuminate more on-ramps into the middle-class economy. I think vocational training, uh, apprenticeships. So I think there's a variety of economic and social programs that would help. I don't want to call it level up men, but massively invest in young people, which would disproportionately um, benefit young men. But my generation, quite frankly, has been stealing from yours <laughs> from about 30 or 40 years. And we're, trying, and we're starting to reap 
um, you know, we're starting to reap the, the externalities, the downsides of that, that massive, uh, what I call just the, the most, you know, the intergenerational theft that is, un, you know, it's just unprecedented in modern, modern society. Mm. Do you, does it feel like to you, or does it seem like that the middle class is dissipating? You know, like we said, the rich are getting you know, the richer, 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 and they're able to, you know, the next level is buying the plane and the G500. But do you feel like that middle class is disappearing? Well, if you actually look at the numbers, the middle class is actually, uh, so, so if you were to look at the actual numbers by household income, the middle class is holding its own, and actually lower income households are, they're both kind of flat. But over the last 40 years, we've had unprecedented prosperity in the United States. There are seven stocks that added $3 trillion of the GDP of Germany just in the last two and a half years, just seven stocks in the U.S. One company in the U.S., Apple, is worth more than the entire FTSE. It's worth more than the entire U.K. stock market. Our GDP growth is, is staggering. Everyone talks about the Chinese miracle. In the last three years, China's stock market is down 40%. I mean, we, the U.S., to a similar extent, Australia, because of the mining boom and natural resources, but we've just recognized unprecedented prosperity. But similar to what you know, the, that, that, has, that technologist said about the future, that it was a great line, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. We've recognized remarkable prosperity in the United States and in the West, Canada, Australia, not as much in the UK, and, but it's not evenly distributed. The majority of those gains, somewhere between 70, 90% of what we call the wealth gains have been crowded, not into the top half. That's fine. We believe in winners and losers in the West. We, it's motivating. If you work your ass off, get lucky. You deserve to have a better life. We've decided that. But do the top 1% deserve 70 to 90 percent of the spoils and in the west our kind of our superpowers are optimism we're willing to invest in crazy crazy stupid ideas that occasionally end up being crazy genius very few societies are willing to do that we're a nation of risk takers but that optimism haunts us because all of us believe our kid is that one you know that one in a hundred and i can prove to every parent mathematically that 99 percent of their children are on the top one percent so while we all know that lottery ticket makes no sense rationally my baby, my ticket's a winner. And so we end up in a society where the majority of the spoils have been shoved into the top 1% because we all sort of unrealistically think that we're going to be that. You know, we're 80% of the people who believe they're above average drivers. So it creates this, I think, a lot of disappointment and shame when young people who seem to be surrounded by people who are either making millions in crypto, because look at all the screenshots on Discord and Reddit, or have incredibly ripped abs and are hanging out at the uh, Four Seasons Bangkok with their fabulous friends, as evidenced by their Instagram feed. All of this prosperity or faux prosperity is being shoved into their face 24 by 7. Meanwhile, meanwhile, they can't afford a home. Uh, the uh, Housing in the United States, $290,000 for an average home pre-COVID. Three years later, it's 420000 So the, the American dream of buying a home. Young men are having trouble finding mates. Uh, it's, you know, it's difficult for young people. They aren't sharing in this massive, this tidal wave of prosperity we've registered in the West. And they're reminded of it. Every, they're reminded of it, you know, every seven seconds on Instagram. It's like, oh, here's someone doing much better than me. And a lot of it's fake. But it's a set, you know, your, your perception of the world sometimes is more important than the reality. In the United States, the economy is super strong right now, but people don't feel good about the economy because uh, when they have an increase in their wages, they credit their grit and their character. And when the price of bread and milk goes up, they blame the government. And they just see every day, you know, they're like, oh, I'm not, I'm not on a private jet to Tulum. That means yeah. I am failing. Have you seen, there's like a, this, I can't remember if he's in LA or New York and this guy outfitted this like inside of a jet and you can rent it and go and film your music videos and take photos and stuff like that. And, and he's take photos. bawling out and it's just, and it's booked flat like all day, every day, six days a week. And it's not real, you know, and it's like people just feeding, feeding it even more. Yeah. That's well. Yeah. The wealth porn, the wealth porn is crazy. And then I worry that a lot of young people are, especially young men are sequestering from society. You know, they, mm. they endure some rejection in online dating they would endure some rejection from colleges or the workplace, and they just sequester to algorithms and screens 
and kind of fall off the map. There's 3 million working age, working able young men in America who just decided they don't, they don't want to work. They're just not, not pursuing a job, not pursuing anything. Mm. And this kind of lost generation of men, if you will, I think there's going to be millions of them. And I think they're going to be a drain on society, a danger to themselves and a danger, danger to others. And it's like, how do you get them back to working? Like if they, once you stop working, the resistance to that must be huge. You know, if you're just in the algorithm all the time, I I don't know how you would pull those people back into society. Well, it's how you pull them back in professionally. And I think that's, for me, it all comes back to kind of economic viability. And that is, I think men, I love this idea of you become a man, you know, different cultures have different sort of litmus tests for when you become a man, right? And I like the idea that once you add surplus value, and I tell my boys this, I'm like, okay, look at all the, look at all the resources you absorb, all the attention, love, resources from your school, from your parents, from society. I mean, you're adding negative value right now, and that's okay. But when you become a man, it's not getting your first job or joining the military or having your first drink or reading from some religious scripture, it's when you add surplus value. And that is you produce more economic value, more care, more love, more protection than you absorb. Mm. That's when you become a man. And I feel as if fewer and fewer men are acquiring or getting the opportunity such they can acquire those skills and strengths and resources such that they can add um, surplus value. And, And then they... I, you know, if by the time they're kind of 25 or 30, they haven't engaged in some sort of tracking or pathing to economic viability, they haven't had an opportunity to establish friendships or romantic relationships. There's a decent, there's a non-zero probability that they will never, it'll never happen to them. Mm. And, you know, what really frightens me is AI, AI driven porn and sex dolls. I worry that we're going to have millions of men who decide to no longer endure the rejection uh, that's involved in, you know, what you call the marketplace for romance and start having relationships with algorithms, AI girlfriends, the search, the search uh, volume for AI girlfriend has exploded. And they estimate that the sex doll industry may be bigger than the motion picture industry within 10 years. The young men are going to sequester and decide not to make the energy to develop friendships, professional relationships, or romantic relationships. And just be at home and have this kind of faux, low calorie, low risk relationship mm. with um, an algorithm and a screen or even a doll. And it sounds yeah. strange and dystopian, but I think it's I think it's coming faster than we think. Yeah, absolutely. What, what was that moment for you when you felt like you contributed more and you went through that, became a man? Uh, that's a that's a generous question. I would say for me. I got a, I shot out of the gates economically pretty early. I was born in the ca- California in the sixties. I had free education from UCLA and Berkeley that was not only economically accessible, but it was accessible because the admissions rate at UCLA was 76%. And I had to apply twice this year. The admissions rate will be probably be nine to 11%. So I had access and I came a professional age when the semiconductor was coming online and the internet in the nineties. So I just had all sort of these gale force winds in my sails. And so I had, I, w- I was adding, I think, economic surplus value at a pretty young age, but a lot of that was just more born at the right place at the right time. I'd like to think the place I add value is when I had kids. I didn't really want kids. I didn't enjoy them. I still don't enjoy other people's children, but I put a lot of energy into trying to be a reasonable father and I think I'm hoping I'm going to produce two very productive, you know, generous, loving men who are good citizens. I think that's and I protect them. I think they feel safe at night. I think they feel they feel good. I'd like to think I'm a good role model in terms of treating their their mother well, which will, I think, be key in their how their approach to women. That's where I'm trying to add surplus value. But there's a lot of ways to add surplus value, whether it's nonprofit work, serving in the armed services, uh, being a good neighbor, voting, helping your family being, you know, we all have, or most families have that one person in the family who's the peacemaker or takes care of dad who might be struggling with dementia. I think there's a lot of ways to add surplus value. I think I came at it later than most people because I'm naturally a very selfish person. 
and I was very focused on my own indulgence. Um, you know, I wanted a series of experiences and, um, and I was very focused on me, but I think kids is a, an awakening for a lot of people that, okay, it's no longer about me. And despite the fact I'm going to invest a great deal in this relationship and some days get negative value back, you know, kids can be awful. Do you have kids, Josh? No, no, but I remember my, my brother and I were quite awful to our single mother. So, <laughs> well, so you were raised by a single mother. I mean, you just, you yeah. know, hard, you just want to go back and just say, God, I'm sorry. So hard. <laughs> So I mean, just, okay, here's mom trying to manage, you know, balance a million plates at a time while doing gymnastics. I know, let's be a real asshole to her. And, you know, despite the Hallmark film and the TikToks of all these little boys and girls playing with their dogs, and I mean, kids can be really tough. Uh, but that's the first time I think I ever really invested, or so far that I've really invested, if you will. Mm. Do you think that once you had that framework like of, you know, giving back more, do you, did it make you less selfish outside in the world or did you pour all of your energy and effort into your, into your kids? I mean, I'm, well, I'm very actually, selfish as well, so I don't, I don't mind being selfish. I think it's got me a lot of places in my life. So that wasn't a negative well, thought. You, you well, you need to fix your own oxygen mask. I don't think there's anything wrong with going hard and trying to find a good mate, trying to make good money, you know, trying to, experience and really enjoy yourself. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, there's something that happens and it's impossible to express to someone who hasn't, doesn't have kids. But when that kid, you know, when my first son came marching out of my girlfriend, it just changed everything for me. It's like, Oh fuck, it's no longer about me. And I remember thinking, and this isn't a great, I thought angels would start singing. And the first thing I thought was I need to make more money. It was very motivating for me. I got my act together. And it, it was so for me, it was very, um, I don't know, it just took everything. Like they say, once we split the atom, society started moving away from kinetic power and astronomy to focus on yourself, like psychology, they, like it unleashed an era where we're like, okay, we are so powerful. We can destroy anything. Now we just need to go inward. I think that a little bit, uh, uh, that's kind of a metaphor for what happens when you have kids. And also, I just want to be clear. I don't, I don't think you need to have kids to be happy. I know a lot of very happy people who don't have children. But in terms of that moment where I went from just being kind of consumption and being all about me, it was um, it was kids. Mm. Yeah, well, I feel, I feel the same way thinking about like Bianca and I are going to get engaged this year. And I'm just like, oh, my God, I'm broke. <laughs> like all I'm thinking about is how like I don't have enough money and I'm just not in that place to like transition my life you know and it just feels like that seems to be happening faster and faster and faster and, and faster you know like when I, I thought i made it had made it money five years ago but then reality taxes and everything like that you're like holy shit like this isn't 100 grand a year is not anything you know to live in live in today's society it's quite what city jarring. do you live in josh I, I was living in vancouver canada at the time i'm in medellin colombia right now so I'm a lot more favorable Jesus, good for you. Yeah, I don't, I, all I can tell you is it gets worse. Yeah, you know, because <laughs> your your expectations and benchmarks and need mm. for, I mean, I think some people, I've always had a real neuroses around money. I have more money than I ever imagined I would have, and I'm still financially insecure. I feel financially insecure. Mm. And it makes no sense rationally. But that's a healthy fear because you're, you're getting engaged uh, if you guys decide to have kids. I think every man should assume he's going to be responsible for the economic health of the household. Yes. And sometimes that yeah. means getting out of the way of your partner and being more supportive of them because sometimes they're better at that whole money thing than you are. Mm. But generally, it's a good place to start and just say, I, if I'm going to engage in a relationship and potentially procreate, I, I need to, a good place to start, a healthy place to start is assume, assume responsibility economically for the household. Mm. And be strong, be disciplined, try and be stoic, make sure you don't spend more than you, you earn, invest, diversify, develop skills that are differentiated that people will pay you for, go into an industry that has a 90 plus percent employment rate, try and avoid sports, nightclubs, DJing, fashion that generally have a 90 or acting that generally have a 90 plus percent unemployment rate. And I don't mean to crush everyone's dreams, but just have a sober conversation with yourself around what it means to take economic responsibility for a household and just be sober about it. Uh, but it's, yeah, you, you're, you're going to feel financially insecure 
um, I wouldn't say your whole life because you're clearly a lifestyle arbitrage guy. If you're in Colombia, you've decided to trade off. I mean, you're, you, you're, you're engaging this massive lifestyle arbitrage where for a hundred grand, if you make a hundred grand a year, my guess is you're going to live a really nice life down there. Uh, at some point you might want to be closer to your family. At some point, your professional opportunities might dictate you moving back to a city. Mm. And in a city with a couple kids and a spouse, it's just crazy how much money it takes. Yeah. And you can feel, I was living in New York with two kids under the age of three. I was making substantially more than that. And I felt broke. And one of the reasons yeah. I moved to Florida was I said, okay, uh, I need to be more thoughtful around how I lower my burn. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Like the the luck piece that of you know you've talked about before, which I totally agree with. Like Bianca's mom immigrated to the United States from Colombia, like illegally, and so Bianca was mm -hmm. born in Texas, and so she she's a Texan citizen, American citizen, and then you know moved to Vancouver because her mom got caught being illegal immigrants, had to flee to Canada, and then mm -hmm. we've ended up back here, and it's just wild to see the rest of her family in complete poverty. And this one person that got across the border has a completely different life. You know, I'd love to, yeah, it's just, it's just really wild to be able to see that, you know, so directly. And I think a lot of us, I mean, me growing up, I grew up in like the country of Western Australia. So it was quite jarring to see the rest of the world later on as I, as I got older. And I just think like we took, take so much for granted and don't realize how lucky we are, you know, and it's just like you see this one family member that, got out, got a degree, did the things that you talk about. And the life is black and white, completely different, you know? Yeah. But the fact you're even thinking that way, means you're more evolved than most men, definitely more evolved <laughs> than sure. I was at your age. <laughs> I mean, my, the general story I told myself until the age of 40 was raised by a single mother. And I overcame who never, he lived and died a secretary. And I overcame this difficult to begin, you know, upbringing to become a baller, like check my shit out. How awesome am I? That was generally the narrative I. That's definitely the people. narrative that plays mostly in my head. <laughs> yeah, like, and I believe so, it. So and, then, then, and then as you get older, you realize a lot of my success isn't my fault. The best mm. decision I ever made was my parents immigrating to the United States, which obviously I had no control over. Yeah. If I my father's from Glasgow, my mother's from London. Uh, neither had both left school in their in eighth grade. If I'd been born in Sandy Hills, Glasgow, with parents who weren't educated and didn't hit lower middle class, I just don't think I'd be here with you right now. Mm. And so it's important as you get older to, you know, take stock of just how fortunate you are. If you're born, you know, if you get to live in a place like Vancouver, you're born in Australia, I mean, you're just you, you just start off with such a good hand. Mm. You know, it's like those poker tournaments where they look at your first two cards and go, okay, you have an 81% chance of winning right now with this, with these first two cards before, mm. you know, they even flip, I forget what it's called, before they even flip the cards. If you're born in a democracy with a strong economy like uh, Australia or Canada or the United States, you're already in the top decile of people born on the planet. You start yeah. in the 90th plus percentile. No one can, you know, not no one, people generally just can't decide to steal from you. It's not about you know, if you work hard, you generally can make a good living. You have certain protections. There's no cruel and unusual punishment. You know, you, you, there's a certain level of, of uh, social programs. If, if you have trouble, you know, there's just, there's just, um, you just start with such a strong hand yeah. and you don't, you don't recognize it. At least I didn't as a, as a younger man. And as I've gotten older, I've just, um, I mean, you do need to do two things when you get older and there's a flip side of that. And that is just as a lot of success is not your fault and you need to be humble. You also need to realize that a lot of your failures are not your fault and you need to forgive yourself. Mm. And I've struggled with anger and depression my whole life. And it's because I'm just stuck in the past. I do something stupid. I make a bad decision. I'm unkind. I make a bad investment and I can't let it go and I can't forgive myself. And I'm too, I, too, I just dwell in the past, live too much in the most immutable thing in the world. And that is, that is the past. And so it's trying to, it's trying to thread a fine needle. I think what it means to be an adult and, a, and an adult man to say, okay, when I'm doing really well, I'm going to recognize a lot of this isn't my fault. I'm going to be less, I'm going to be more humble and more mm -hmm. grateful. 
But at the same time, if I get laid off, if I lose some money in the market, if someone I like, you know, I like someone more than they like me, whatever it might be, forgive yourself, forgive yourself. A lot of that isn't your fault either. Mm. Well, I have one last question for you, which is, and maybe you just answered it, but what do you feel like guys need to hear right now? If you could have a message for guys at the moment, like the current state of where things are at. It's a good question. I'm, not, I'm, I'm thinking what, do, what is, what is the, what is it the guys need to hear? Um, you know, that they have value that, Men play an important role. Young men, if you're if you're struggling and you don't see a path, an immediate path to prosperity or relationships, to know that at some point almost every man feels that way. And that it's important that you every day be willing to ask people for help, be willing to forgive yourself, and make progress. Be physically fit. Work out. You know, it's kind of one of the first things I tell young men is be strong. It's going to help you mentally. It's going to help you make better decisions. Uh, get your shit together. Have a plan. It, it, maybe you don't even stick to your plan, but have a plan and every day make progress against it. Um, don't blame others when you're not doing well. It's so easy to demonize immigrants or be angry at women or think your parents aren't your allies. No, no, none of that's true. But you have value. Young men have played a, a really important role in our society. We need, we need viable young men. Um, try and get in great shape as an initial. I, I, I just think every study is showing that if you can be healthy and strong, uh, everything else gets a little bit easier. I'm not just talking about curls and bench press. I'm saying everything in your life is going to get a little bit easier. And you're much less likely to be angry and depressed. And you're more, you know, you're more attractive to friends, potential mates. The one thing, 490 of the Fortune 500 CEOs work out four to five times a week. That's the one thing really successful people have in common. And re realize when you hit, when you, when you hit really tough spots, really tough spots, um, that's part of the journey. And ask people for help, lean on your relationships and realize that this, this too shall end and that that's just part of the journey of being a man. Mm. Amazing. Thanks, Scott. Really appreciate it. That was great. Thank you, Josh. Thanks for your good work.